Hello, everyone. Today we'll discuss central nervous system oncology. My name is Jerry Jaboyne. I'm associate professor and section chief for CNS oncology here at OHSU Radiation Medicine. I just want to note that all copyrighted images cited here are within compliance of the Fair Use Act. Um, I do thank these clinical leaders for the contribution to the field and the contribution to this lecture. So brain tumors, CNS oncology. In 2019, the American Cancer Society estimated there would be approximately 23,820 CNS tumors, with death from CNS tumors to be predicted to be about 17,760 in the United States. So uh, this is an uh, order of magnitude fewer tumors than the big four, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. However, still highly impactful and highly destructive. There's a large number of tumor types under the um, World Health Organization's classifications of CNS tumors. Um, here I've listed the major groupings uh, as cited by the update within 2016. So for who grading? Uh, so rather than staging for uh, CNS disease and tumors, there's a grading system. These tumors are site, typically site, limited uh, within the craniospinal axis, although uh, high-grade tumors have been known in, to met out into the systemic lymph node basins. But I'll say here, uh, when you're looking at who gradium gliomas, which is the largest group of adult CNS tumors, uh, you can split them into low-grade and high-grade, low-grade being grades one and two. Um, so these have atypical nuclei in general, um, uh, although nowadays, uh, World Health Organization now does uh, not just histologic grading, but utilizes a lot of molecular data in order to better risk stratify tumors. So for gliomas, positive gastritoma, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma are, are both grade one. Grade tumors include pleomorphic xantherastrocytoma, oligodendrogliomas um, that are IDH mutant or 1P19Q codeleted, uh, a 1P or 19 uh, Q deletion uh, changes this in, and it drops into diffuse astrocytoma um, category. Then there's diffuse astrocytoma, which is uh, the IDH mutant version of that. It falls into the grade two criteria. So for high grade, those are grades three and four. These pertain a worse prognosis um, and it, it nearly universal, unfortunately, in this category of tumors. Um, that said, uh, who grade three tumors include anaplastic astrocytoma, Anaplastic oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant 1P19Q codeleted, and antiplastic pleomorphic xantheroastrocytoma, also who three, um, who three. Apologize here, I'm looking at my slides and note the um, misspelling of pleomorphic. Um, so who four include glioblastoma, these can be IDH wild type or mutant, uh, diffuse midline glioma, which is uh, a high grade variant that's more common in children but pretends a particularly nasty um, survival. Uh, of nine to 12 months. Uh, this is characterized by a molecular mutation, um, H3K27M mutation. So th this previously was a uh, large number of tumors that, that are present in the pons called diffuse intrinsic um, ponting glioma. And that's, that term still exists, but not within the WHO 2016 classification. Now, if this tumor is um, uh, biopsied and has this mutation, then we know it to be this new term called diffuse midline glioma uh, in children. Um, very, very poor prognosis in adults, a little bit less um, understanding about how that affects survival. Uh, then we have oligodendroglioma um, that is high grade. So uh, these are IDH mutant 1P19Q codeleted, but can be a GBM as well. And there's anaplastic oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant 1P19Q codeleted. This should be WHO3, not 4. Um, so uh, both should be WHO3, not 4. So, or other tumors. Um, so we looked at gliomas, which is the largest category, but there's a high frequency of meningiomas. This is the most common benign tumor in adults. Uh, one is vastly most common. Uh, meningiomas have a uh, very little impact on survival, though they can be highly morbid. Uh, they frequently not be covered at all in resection and often need to be actively surveilled. Um, so these are, at the time of my day, used to be found to be slightly less frequent in 
than uh, GBMs, but now we realize that there's quite a few patients that have this that never become symptomatic. So frequency has probably been significantly underestimated. Atypical meningiomas or who two meningiomas have a slightly increased risk of recurrence um, and a little bit more atypical um, histologic parameters. So we'll discuss that later if we have time. Then anaplastic meningioma, who three meningiomas are the most aggressive category of disease and they do impact survival. In fact, this could be considered malignancy uh, rather than just a benign tumor as in who one and two. Pendomomas, uh, another classification of tumor, is also fairly common, not nearly as common as meningiomas, but um, who won for that, those tumors are some of pendomomas and mixopapillary pendomomas. Um, these are um, relatively slow growing progressive tumors, um, although mixopapillary uh, only involves the um, conoquina, making it uh, impossible to completely resect, uh, so it can impact more morbidity as well as mortality. Then you have a pendomoma, which is HU2, a pendomoma relifusion. This is the new uh, added category in the 2016 grading. Um, this relifusion protein um, is difficult to characterize for prognosis because it tends to occur in HU2s and 3s, and which pretend your prognosis, uh, greater recurrence risk. Um, but if you're HU3 and rel high relifusion, you're more likely to be a tumor. Anaplastic pendomoma is the most aggressive category at HU3. Then you have cord plexus tumors at even decreasing frequency from ependymomas. Um, these can be papillomas, grade one, uh, atypical papillomas, grade two, or carcinomas, grade three, again, with behavior that's more similar, more akin to malignancy. So there's lots and lots of categories that we cited for who, uh, classification of CNS tumors. We can't go through all of the grading systems, but most tumors do fall within one subset. So if you're looking at the largest sets of categories outside of what we've already discussed, it would be All HU4 medulloblastomas to what we used to call PNET tumors, all grade four, and all cellular tumors um, are grade one. So that uh, craniopharyngiomas, et cetera, uh, there's lots in that category, which we would be responsible to and as a resident in the field of radiation oncology, but not a little bit too much to go through in our lecture. So for this case review, I want to limit us to what you'd likely see most on a rotation of either adults, um, which would be glioblastoma, or kids, diffuse midline glioma, medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma would be far more common than diffuse midline glioma. So glioblastoma, or GBM. Um, this is the most common adult intracranial malignancy. Um, by definition, um, this the grading for this is grade four. That's the classification for glioblastoma. Right? Previously, we did that purely on it's logic criteria, and we used to use the term AMEN, which you might be familiar with from your medical school, school exams. Still, I believe that's probably part of your exam, looking at um, uh, endothelial proliferation, necrosis, mitosis, and ATPI as your criteria for uh, being a, uh, a glioblastoma. But this classification includes the IDH mutant, as we discussed on the prior slide, the IDH wild type. Um, so again, this is a marker on the cell that um, for a protein, and if it's mutated, the protein is not there, um, so that it's harder for um, repair to occur, so harder for survival of the cells. Um, so the cells with IDH mutation are more responsive to alkylating agents and therefore have a much longer survival than cells that do not have that mutation. And then again, there's diffuse midline glioma, which we'll discuss after this section. So prognosis is generally poor for all glioblastoma, but molecular characterization can stratify response to therapy. So IDH1 and two mutants um, definitely have improved responsiveness to alkylating agents. We test these now routinely after biopsying tumors. IDH1 is at a frequency of about 90% compared to IDH2 mutations, and this occurs in typically younger individuals. And again, this suggests a different lineage of GBM as the IDH wild types. There's hypermethylation of MGMT. There's another marker, and this occurs in about half of um, tumors, but far more frequently for those under the age of 60. And, and this actually is a marker of, of prognosis. It's also a marker of responsiveness to therapy, but definitely one of prognosis um, with patients living um, up to uh, twice as long with the MGMT hypermethylation. So other molecular features do exist, um, but they're at relatively low frequency. So most of these are less than 4%, uh, probably on the order of 1% to 2% of all tumors. We've had patients with oncogenic fusion proteins with NTREC or ROS1, 
or FGFR3 TAC3 mutations. Um, there are novel drugs for these, um, like uh, intractamid or LOXO for drug inhibition that um, have been shown in um, cases across different tumor types to have survivals. Um, though um, these driver mutations can be still overcome and just definitely um, can recur after some period of time. Anyway, so how do these present? So most commonly by headaches. Uh, secondly, by seizures. These seizure presentation is more common in lower grade tumors. And you can see that uh, these lower grade tumors are far more common in younger adults and children. Um, so it's good to be able to distinguish the difference, but there is significant overlap. So in high grade tumor seizures are about 20% of patients, whereas it's closer to 70 to 80% uh, based on older data for lower grade tumors. We also have focal neurologic symptoms. Uh, these include memory loss, weakness, visual deficits, expressive or receptive aphasias, personality changes. All this dependent upon where the tumor is for the most part, but also how much compressive vasogenic edema mass effect can happen outside of the area of the tumor. So really there can be acute stroke-like symptoms. Um, so this is not the typical presentation for a GBM. And they do hemorrhage um, that this in, an, in about 2% of patients or less this can cause an acute change in neurologic status that could be confused with a stroke. So this is a uh, one of my patients. Uh, here you can see on the left a T1 enhancing tumor. So this is important. Uh, this MRI here, you can tell that it's a contrasted MRI because you can see that the blood vessels are lit up. The white gray matter, you can tell the big difference because there's a different vascularity gray matter, but in the tumor, there's a high vascularity uh, where there's endothelial cell proliferation here. So these tumors tend to light up bright on T1 post-contrasted images. The dark area here is more likely um, tissue swelling from the tumor um, that appears dark. So on a T1 contrasted image, you can see light indicating that there's good vascularity and that's a hence enhancing tumor, so T1 bright. T1 dark, it's usually indicative of um, something dense, it's not vascular. In this case, we know it's fluid. Uh, this tumor you can also see has what we call mass effect. So you can see here that the ventricles should look the same on both sides, but this side on the right side, there's some compression of the tissue that's distorting the tissue and closing the ventricles. So this is a T1 enhancing mass, significant vasogenic edema and mass effect uh, here. Uh, we can look at the T2 image. So T2 means uh, is a way of looking at the MRI that doesn't involve um, uh, the relaxation phase is tuned to be able to detect fluid, making fluid white. So this is the CSF here in the ventricles that is white. What is also white is um, edema, so swelling from the tumor. So you can see that the tumor is here, correlates to the tumor here, and it's actually dark. There's areas within the tumor that are white because it's a heterogeneous tumor. pockets of fluid within the tumor that's lighting up bright, but most of the brightness is outside the tumor, and this is, the, again, the vasogenic edema, so um, swelling from the tumor here. Um, what we also like to do is get something called the FLARE study, which we'll look at that later, but just this is a good comparison of a T1 enhancing tumor with significant vasogenic edema. So how do we treat these? Um, so we, we're going to presume this, this is a GBM. The most common malignancy of, in the brain actually is a brain metastasis. From the tumor, but primary, it would be GBM. So for a 60-year-old uh, individual, we would have a high suspicion for high GBM. So standard care is something called the STOOP trial. So this is a European trial that was completed in uh, Oregon in uh, 2015. And in this phase three trial, we already had knowledge that uh, radiation was very important to uh, prolong life in this patient set. These patients lived about a year. It was based on how good their performance status was, but you could expect them to live from six months to a year from the time that this trial was starting to be conducted. Um, what they want to do is determine if this new chemotherapy, this new oral acylating agent, temozolomide, could impact survival. So they took uh, radiation alone, 60 gray and 30 fractions, and compared that to radiation amide at 75 milligrams per meter squared per day for 42 days, followed by a four-week break 
and which then you started delivering uh, five days of 200 milligrams per meter squared per day to, uh, every 23 days for six cycles. So we get six months of this drug, oftentimes starting off actually at 150 milligrams to, to make sure patients tolerate it. Uh, this was the, the, um, the major trial and the only major trial within 10, 15 years to have any success. What they found here was that 88% of patients actually were able to complete the Less than half actually were able to this is a good drug, but again, it's still a chemotherapy agent like radiation. These are all toxic agents and can be difficult for patients to, to um, tolerate. All said, grade three toxicity was still less than 4%. So this is well tolerated course of therapy compared to the chemotherapies that were out there. So what do we do here? So we moved the median survival from 12 months to 14.6 months, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but at the time, this was the biggest advance in uh, over 20 years. The rest of free survival was extended from five months to seven months. So on, most often with the RTO alone, you'd see the tumor come back in rate of five months. And this extended it by a couple months, which was, again, very significant at the time. You can see here that what we would demonstrate most when we were doing the presentations at the time, that there'd be 26% a two-year overall survival compared to 10% um, to your overall survival. So if you took highly selected patients, you could see that those patients could live about a year and a half. So looking at the two-year mark wasn't um, a ridiculous thing, but we, we definitely had the, the ex in prolongation of survival in this cohort at, at four years. You could see that that was um, that difference continued. So this these um, curves didn't um, come back together uh, early. And at five years, you can see this 10%, 2% range. And Again, this is a significant improvement in overall survival um, for a disease that's still uh, nearly universally fatal. Here's a demonstration of these uh, this in the England Journal of Medicine um, back just before I started my training or just while I was starting my training. Significant difference between radiotherapy plus temozolomide. Um, when you looked at methylated MGMT versus I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, MGMT, again, um, is, um, is a DNA repair gene. If you methylate it, that knocks out the function of that, that gene, making there no or minimal MGMT available for DNA repair. So we believe that uh, plenty of uh, different uh, therapies have been noting an improvement in survival in the group, especially if they're receiving alkylating agents, but even radiation or electrical tumor fields, which we might discuss a little bit at the end of this section, can extend life in most significantly in the group that have the MGMT silence or hypermethylated MGMT. So if you look at MGMT status in these patients, in the ERTC patients, so the STUP trial, you notice that MGMT was a very favorable prognostic. So you'd have a almost a 50% so median survival of 15.3 months is 21.7 months, um, where there was no significant difference uh, for unmethylated MGMT. So for those patients, when you did temozolomide in that group, there was a, a numerical improvement of maybe a couple of weeks in that group, but not a statistically significant difference. There's been other studies that have shown that if you do treat enough patients, there might be a benefit, and there's definitely some type of tail in that curve. but. Uh, the greatest benefit for alkylating agents is still within the MGMT group arm. And for some practices, um, they will not treat the unmethylated MGMT, um, particularly if a patient's having any side effects or toxicity from the drug. So conclusions, GBM with, with methylated MGMT benefits significantly from temozolomide um, with minimal to no benefit for the unmethylated MGMT promoter. So here's that same patient. They've been resected. It's a good resection. They've removed the the uh, T1 enhanced mass. This is no, no longer a T1 contrast scan, so we can't call this enhancing here. If we know that's where this was. Um, this is a flare image. This is not a T2. Here we're looking at fluid, but we are fluid attenuated. So we took the, pro the, the fluid from the CSF is it out, and just the fluid remaining um, is here. So you can see that there's less basogenic edema. Patient's mass has been relieved by the decompression of the tumor mass. They're in likely steroid therapy and they're, they're comfortable. So what do we do next? This is where we do the stoop treatment. So we're gonna do 60 gray and 30 fractions. So we're gonna give tr radiation treatment daily at two gray per fraction to our, uh, our tumor volume with concurrent temozolomide uh, given sometimes the night before. 
or the morning of at 75 milligrams per meter squared. Um, there's some contention here. So as a medical student rotating for a residency, I don't want you to, um, to go too crazy. There's classic volumes and then there's um, what we call more modern volumes. Um, but basically um, in the, the classic radiation therapy oncology group, um, group trials, we used to do um, treat patients to 23 fractions to 46 gray to our enhancing area adding a 2.5 centimeter margin. And then we boost the higher T1 uh, post-GAD contrasting uh, area by another 2.5 centimeters to the final 60 gray. Um, that's been the classic field for years. This is what we call our board answer in this country. However, the ERTC volumes, which were have been used plentifully, are smaller. So they're only doing two centimeter margin on the um, T1 contrasting tumor bed, uh, plus about 0.5 uh, for setup. And they try to make sure they go and include anything that's uh, um, flare or T2 signal. So they want to make sure they grab it, but they don't necessarily need to put a significant margin around that. The idea is significantly reduce the total volume that you give the brain, uh, which potentially reduces toxicity depending on how much uh, T2 or flare there is for a tumor. Uh, I'd say that that's become more of a standard. It, it's easier to plan because you're treating everything to one dose in volume. Um, you do have to do th things when you're exceeding toxicity, for instance, on the brainstem or the optic apparatus, uh, which um, a lot of people uh, will choose to do in a simultaneous integrated boost. So the idea being instead of doing two different plans and having to sum them and determining where your doses are, you do one plan and, and plan to treat to 50 gray to an area that would be below the tolerance of below the tolerance of uh, the structures that you're concerned about, which would primarily be the spinal cord, brain stem, and optic apparatus, um, and then treat the rest of the tumor to high dose. Um, so the only other uh, thing I mentioned here is American Brain Tumor Consortium, UAB, Wake Forest, Cleveland Clinic, um, MD Anderson, they all treat with smaller uh, tumor margins. Again, there's disease because the way this disease um, likes to spread out like fingers across uh, into the tissue that you can look out three centimeters and still see tumor cells. However, uh, most recurrences are infield to the tune of um, three quarters of tumors will come back within the local site. So since the uh, reducing the volume causes improvement in toxicity without a change in uh, failure patterns, it seems fair to use this volume and then reserve uh, additional treatments for the um, for patients to potentially utilize uh, after they fail their initial course. Of so um, what else do we have? So that's category one, the STOOP trial. This is category 1B. So uh, there, this is the only other advance we've had in the last two decades, and it's been a relatively recent advance. Um, here, this, these uh, nice pads uh, can train electrical leads. And what they do is they attach this battery and they pump alternate electrical currents across the brain, creating a different and a magnetic field, which can impact tumor growth. Um, the, the trial design, and we're gonna move a little bit more quickly through this. Um, for newly diagnosed patients, they had 700 patients randomized two to one, and they would do tumor treating fields or temozolomide um, for the adjuvant phase. So uh, tumor treating fields, temozolomide or temozolomide alone. And what they what they want to do is assess after first progression and continue therapy, but the salvage agent or uh, therapy you needed, and then evaluate at second progression or 24 months. So that was the primary endpoint being progression free survival, secondary endpoint being overall survival. But they also really want to look at quality of life measures um, uh, as well. So um, this was very good risk stratification. They've shown their data multiple times, and these these two cohorts were well um, well distributed, and they were well in terms of methylated MGMT status, which you can you could probably note would definitely impact the overall survival rate. These were well distributed patients. The one negative of this trial is that it wasn't blinded. So if you had leads on your head and you was plugged into a battery, you were getting tumor treating fields. If you didn't have that, you were not. Um, so there, that was the uh, one significant bias of the the um, therapy. But that said, we can note that there was an improvement in overall survival and progression-free survival um, for these, this trial. And I won't go into too much, but there's 
a 20% improvement in median survival. So it, um, for stoop, and this had a similar to uh, almost 30% increase in overall survival in year two. So it, it, the way I consider this for my treatment algorithm, if the patient's not on the trial, and especially if they have an methylated MGMT, this is the therapy to give in the absence of a new that exclude the, the use of tumor treatment fields. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but this is something for you to at least be aware of. So now to move to diffuse midline glioma. This is the other high-grade glioma that's that's category, categorized as a glioblastoma. And this occurs most likely, most often in kids. It's characterized by this new, uh, with this uh, more recently um, elucidated uh, K27M mutation. Uh, being that it requires a mutation, then it requires a biopsy in order to be able to diagnose. This is important to know because without a biopsy, you won't be able to get on most trials that will be testing novel agents to this, um, this tumor. So that said, the, the current standard of care treatment and the only treatment that's been proven to be effective is radiation. Um, so ra radiation um, basically prolongs life, but this can still confers a significantly um, horrible prognosis of months, uh, maybe three to six months without radiation. So how do these patients present? Uh, typically, uh, th these are presented, these tumors are uh, in the pons and brainstem, although they can be in the thalamus or upper spinal cord as well. So uh, abnormalities and eye movement are the most common, most frequently seen changes. You can see facial weakness, often unilateral, but not necessarily. Numbness, inner weakness, extremities also often unilateral. These can affect gait, so gait instability, uh, often more related to musculoskeletal impact cerebellar or cerebellar peduncle impact, although that also exists. And there also can be headaches, nausea, sunsetting signs, et cetera. Uh, historically, it's been diagnosed by imaging. So the, the classic imaging appearance um, would be here on the right. Um, you see a diffusely enhancing um, T2 enhancing flare, in this case, flare enhancing um, mass that's involving the brainstem. You can see a diffuse change in the so these are intrinsic tumors. They're typically not nodular, and there's typically not a very well discernible mass, uh, although there are exophytic tumors uh, here. <clears throat> but historically, this is how we, we did it. Um, now we do try to do biopsy, especially since uh, 2016, with the advent of these new trials looking at um, uh, drugs like on 201. Uh, is the approach of liquid biopsies. So people are looking into that. There's uh, a group in DC that's that's restarted their work in Germany and in Michigan, uh, but these have not been validated and are not FDA approved for use yet. Um, that said, uh, the increased frequency of biopsies has not less led to significantly increased toxicity from the biopsies. Um, most patients do very well uh, and uh, nurses can be very selective in where they biopsy in order to limit the damage at our institute and only one patient with any toxicity has been reversible um, in the last four years. So we it's become more standard, um, certainly over the last decade. So again, radiation is the primary modality for treatment. You treat 54 gray and 30 fractions as the standard of care treatment. Um, there are other options. You can treat uh, the Egyptian uh, trial, which used 13 fractions of three gray, so to create a shorter course to get patients to move faster. But most clinical trials require to use this 54 gray and 30 fractions, so this is the standard. Take your GTV and your flare, uh, uh, T1 combination, which is mostly flare. Add one centimeter to create your CTV and add three to five millimeters to create your PTV. On the CTV, you're paying attention to normal anatomy, so one centimeters can be a, a uh, posterior lateral, but it, it all depends on where the tumor lies. Free radiation at progression is possible and safe. So we've been doing that at an increasing rate more recently. Um, increasing rate in general. So it's 20, 24 gray and 2 gray per fraction. Uh, UCSF and MD Anderson have good data showing that this is very safe, that increasing the dose per fraction can increase toxicity more than doing a relatively low dose with um, conventional fractionation. So free radiation is, is something that we've been doing with significant symptomatic um, benefit, some 
maybe progression and improvement in life, but low toxicity. The new agents that I mentioned before that target the K27M um, mutant tumors, the on 201 trials, selective DRD2 antagonists, various delivery approaches, um, various institutions uh, all happening. Uh, we're waiting to see you know, where this will take us. So the final group of tumors, so uh, medulloblastoma, this is the most common brain malignancy of childhood. So that said, you know, uh, of the 25,000 tumors that we see each year, this represents only five to 600 cases. Of so that's 20% of childhood brain tumors, which in and of themselves are one-tenth of total brain tumors in adults and kids. So one thing to go into this is always to realize that it is unnatural um, for a child to get cancer. And these cases are all very difficult because even the survivors have significant issues. Uh, so here, this tumor arises in the posterior fossa. There's a high potential for dissemination in the CSF. So about 30% of patients historically would, uh, would have CSF involvement or M plus disease at diagnosis. The median age of presentation is five to seven years of age. So these are generally young kids, but 75% of them presenting it um, below the age of eight, uh, 15 years. So clinical presentation is all about the location. So a mass in the posterior fossa would cause increased posterior fossa pressure. Uh, it would manifest as headache, nausea, vomiting, uh, gait, and ataxia. Infants, um, you know, ataxia, headache, not, uh, not as easy to tell, so that you might notice head tilt and increasing head circumference for these uh, infants who don't have used plates and a decline in attaining milestones. So on examination, you would notice uh, papilledema, nystagmus, uh, CNS abnormalities, cranial nerve abnormalities. So MRI brain and spine is the workup for this tumor. Um, one thing to note is uh, there's an opportunity here to relieve pressure because these usually manifest after you've reached a certain size and you're, you're blocking the, uh, the outflow track of CSS fluid. Um, that said, the, the goal is not to shunt if possible. It's, to do maximally safe resection, which uh, in most cases is enough to improve the flow to avoid the need for shunting. Uh, during that resection, however, an aggressive uh, uh, resection can cause dermis, uh, damage to the vermis or midline cerebellum, which um, is a, something that I think would be on your medical school exams, but definitely will be in your residency exams as manifesting as what kind of syndrome. And I'll uh, state that posterior fossa syndrome a frequently asked question. Um, there's a lot, a constellation of signs for damage in the region, but um, when you damage this region of the brain, the ones that we think of most often are cerebellar mutism. It's interesting. Uh, patients lose the ability to speak, and this can be at variable levels of penetration from just a broken speech to an ability to produce words at all. Um, um, gait instability, uh, um, emotional liability, um, uh, and I have a slide that, that will highlight some more of those, those features. Um, so what do you do after that? So after your maximally safe resection, you do post-operative MRI, uh, determination of how much has been removed. Um, historically, we like to say that if it's um, less than 1.5 cubic centimeters that remain, then we've had a very good resection. If there's more um, in the past, we'd consider a redo resection because it would place the patient at risk. Um, now we're a little bit less aggressive with that approach, but um, I still think that that's probably the norm is to get as a good resection as possible with, with limiting your risk of posterior fossa syndrome, which still happens at a very high rate. Um, so 10 to 14 days, you want to see if your CSF fluid is positive. So that's when you assay for CSF and do an LP. I'm going to do staging very briefly here. Um, basically, th this is uh, M plus or M zero. So M1 is CSF positive, um, M2, intracranial tumor beyond M3 is gross nodular seeding of the spinal subarachnoid space, M4 is metastasis beyond the cerebrospinal access. Risk groupings, average risk is greater than or equal to three years of age, M0 less than 1.5 centimeters of residual disease, cubic centimeters, not square centimeters. High risk disease, um, M positive residual disease or diffuse anaplasia, and for infants, it's a different algorithm of treatment. So these, the survival for infants is similar to high-risk um, patients, mostly, mostly because the effects of radiation at that young age are devastating on the patient's growth. 
and intellectual maturity. So these patients, uh, if possible, we try to do massively safe resection with chemotherapy regimens uh, until they um, can tolerate therapy, radiation therapy. Doses of radiation are determined based on some big trials. The first uh, and published standard trial would still be CCG 9892. In that trial, um, we, within 31 days for maximally safe resection, we gave 23% more grade to the average risk group or 36 grade to the high risk group. We could send Kristen, adjuvant CCNU, and Kristen and Splatinum. We boost the posterior faucet to 54 gray, and effectively it'd be a one centimeter, you'd take the volume of one centimeter lateral to the vertical body to so make sure you get it coverage. All this would be done 3D. will be to get the entire thecal sac two centimeters below it and all the outpouchings of the nerve foramina within your field. Um, so what we do, we defer RT for uh, less than three year olds, as I discussed, and um, there has been an update. So we, we were able to successfully reduce the dose from 36 to 22.4. Or could we bring the dose down to 18 gray, uh, which potentially could reduce our neurocognitive fatigue and endocrine effects even more. So we, in this trial, we, we did that, just that. Dr. Molsky presented this data in 2016's um, session. Uh, the update, and, and it was evident that uh, lowering the dose from 23.4 to 18 gray um, just resulted in too many uh, spinal recurrences, so we found we couldn't do that. But the other part of the trial where we were able to do, instead of posterior fossa boost, to do a resection bed plus a small margin was found to not um, increase the recurrence risk. Uh, this was found earlier from people who were doing a subset of this these tumors on trial and off trial. Uh, in a four institution, uh, we're able to show that uh, in Merchant and all in, in 2008 that you could do that a two centimeter or 2.5 centimeter margin in the resection bed and also still have increased uh, without increased recurrence. So, again, the reduction in uh, volume can reduce the acute and long term toxicity to therapy. Um, so, whenever we want to do that, um, uh, this has not been published in full manuscript form at the time of this lecture. Um, but hopefully it will be, um, but I believe it's become a standard without that publication, uh, which ha often happens in the pediatric world. Um, so where might you not want to do this? So we were initially involved Freeman of Lushka, which is uh, the lateral um, drainage points in the um, posterior fossa. Then you want to make sure that you don't uh, that you cover the entire posterior fossa to make sure that you don't miss uh, disease, extent of disease. Also for high-risk patients, this is still not the standard. Although there is data <laughs> suggesting that there is an increased risk of recurrence. Uh, it's still for the standard for your boards. You would want to do whole posterior fossa radiation. Also, what's become more of an issue and more a discussion point is how your craniospinal radiation. Um, we love to test you, and I, I did not put those slides in here on this approach to setting fields for, pro, uh, for um, a creative spiral radiation, but the field is moving more and more towards acceptance of proton radiation for um, definitive treatment when possible for patients with medulloblastoma. So I, I won't go through that here, except to show you uh, the potential benefits dosimetrically of proton therapy. We have proton therapy on the left, you can see your low dose lines basically at end in the distal anterior and the vertebral body to the spinal canal uh, with no exit dose. Uh, um, so at the time of, of this publication, I'm not sure that they're even using spread out brain peaks. So neutron contamination is a possibility. I'm not sure what the full potential application, uh, potential downstream effects are from a sector of malignancy standpoint, but you can see that all this disease, all this. Uh, Area is at least not treated, which can affect acute toxicity for sure. And um, based on some studies, can have a, even a, up to a five fold reduction in, in new secondary malignancies later on. This is a, um, a matched field here. You can see where the match is on this dosimetrically, but you can see all this low dose spray in the body. Uh, difficulty with dejunctioning. Um, again, here on the left, proton, they're very tight fields and on the right uh, through and through low-dose radiation. 
Um, so we could talk about this. There's data that's come out on impact on autotoxicity, on neurocognitive, um, uh, the neurocognitive impact, the height impact. Um, there's not been any um, smoking guns because it's difficult to accrue to these trials once you have the ability to do this treatment and you know that dosimetrically it's uh, easier to achieve, it's difficult to fill out those trials, but this is just good for you to know. So uh, just to wrap up, complications of treatment, posterior fossil syndrome, note that, uh, know that we do have a neurocognitive impairment. Uh, reducing the dose that was potentially something that we can reduce the degree of impairment, but that data is, is difficult. The decreased height uh, is, is strongly pronounced for medulloblastoma patients. We believe that this is not just because of epiphyseal closure, but because of the impact on the endocrine system, especially growth hormone. You can see here is impacted 94 to 95 percent of the time. Hypothyroidism and ACTH reductions are also um, high frequency, 50 percent, 43 percent, and you still can affect thyroid hormone. So, uh, one active part of follow-up for these patients is um, endocrine follow-up and trying to make sure that if we do have a deficiency in these areas, which we will for growth hormone, that we're, we're there and able to uh, replete. Cataracts, um, definitely uh, possible, depending on the therapy that we're doing. Supervascular disease, there's a high risk of strokes. Um, this actually seems to be even higher risk for radiation in children as opposed to adults. And then there's the risk of secondary neoplasm, which is the, the one that's uh, pretty devastating. They do have a, a recent publication 1,000 medulloblastoma patients, they showed a rate of about 95% of disease <clears throat> in that group. Uh, of those 25% were meningioma, and um, there was uh, hydroglioma, it was on the order of one or two, but all this is possible, uh, and this is what you need to uh, discuss to make sure your patients are informed. So um, again, key points, first is how do medulloblastoma patients present? reduce CSI to 18 gray. Are there benefits to proton therapy? What are those benefits? When might you consider addition of whole posterior fossa boost versus um, tumor bed plus margin? What is posterior fossa syndrome? How frequent does it occur? Time. What is the most common secondary neoplasm associated with medulloblastoma treatment in GMS? All right, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you allowing me to jam pack a 30 minute, <laughs> probably two hour talk. 30, 40 minutes where we ended up being. Um, I look forward to having you here in person and visiting with our patients. Good luck on your journey.